Hey, good evening, everybody. How y'all doing? So, welcome back to another edition of Good Stream University. I am going through a series on grocery row gardening. And so far we have covered how to grow your own grocery grow garden and where the system actually came from. So I'm going to give everybody a minute here to start catching up as uh, it goes it goes live. So I want to say uh, welcome to Tracy and Good Times Homestead, new members of this channel. Martin, welcome. I really appreciate it. Hi, Karen. Good to see you. Dr. TikTok has got the ticket for Scrub Fest 2022. If you guys don't know what Scrub Fest 2022 is, it will be totally lit. It's at uh, Scrubland Farms, a little north of Fort McCoy in Florida, coming up the middle of this next month. I actually planned something ahead. Can you believe it? But it's at a plant nursery that has an incredible, great selection of edible plants, including a lot of rare stuff and some tropical stuff and rare medicinals. And man, it, it is, it's like what I wish my plant nursery had been. <laughs> it's so great. There's so many good plants there. So anyhow, um, that's Sam that runs that nursery. It's Scrubland Farms Nursery. And I, we are doing Scrub Fest there and I will be talking and, uh, it's going to be fun. So, Hey, Good to see you all. Um, today we are covering tropical climate grocery row gardening, and I this this series that we're doing right now is really perfect timing for me. There's a reason I'm doing it right now, and that is because I am starting my third grocery row garden. Yesterday we talked about how to till out or how you could till or start with lasagna gardening or with tarping. We talked about the spacing and the different spacing that you could do in a grocery row garden and how that's how that sort of works. So ah, thank you very much for the uh, super chat. I'm sorry. Much appreciated. So today we are going to go and talk about tropical climate grocery row gardening. Now, I know a lot of you guys are probably not living in the tropics. I do have a lot of subscribers from Florida. I have quite a few subscribers from California, some of which are in Southern California. I know that I have some subscribers from Hawaii. But a lot of a lot of you guys are somewhere in the south and some of you are further north. Some of you are up in Canada, some of you are in colder parts of Australia and uh, Great Britain. I know we have some from Germany. There's a lot of different uh, places represented on this channel, but this slice of it, we're going to talk about tropical climate grocery row gardening because there are many of you that are in the Caribbean or in India. I know there we've had uh, Trinidad, Guyana, Grenada, St. Thomas, and Puerto Rico, a lot of folks that are there and uh, I know Philippines, Indonesia, I see a lot of you subscribers and I know that there's not a lot of really gardening channels that necessarily talk about the tropics because it tends to be clustered up into North America and into temperate climates. So here we go, Colorado, Central Georgia, Florida, Louisiana, Arizona, upstate New York, <laughs> Southern Arizona. So we will talk about tropics today and then tomorrow we are going to cover temperate climate grocery row gardening. So a grocery row garden, garden is basically an agro small backyard agroforestry system where you have an orchard that is overlaid with vegetable gardens. And uh, today we do not have the members only chat on. It is uh, limited to subscribers and members. But uh, if it gets too crazy, we'll just go back to members for the, the rest of the week because I'm trying to get through a, a huge amount of information and I am rather distractible, if you guys haven't noticed. So we are going to cover tropics. So let's talk about the tropics. We lived for four years 
down at the bottom of the Caribbean island chain at a little island called Grenada, which was 21 miles long, 12 miles wide, off the coast of Trinidad and Venezuela. It was a year-round warm climate. The coldest it got was about 72 degrees. The warmest it got was maybe 90 degrees. It would touch 90 every once in a while. So that climate is very different than a climate with a pronounced freeze cycle. It's basically like having a permanent spring, a permanent warm spring where you had nice cool air overnight. Cool air meaning it felt like it was air conditioned. It was like, you know, 73, 74, 75 degrees. You get this nice cool breeze coming up through the cocoa orchards. During the day, it would get warm and steamy, but it was not as hot even as it gets in Mississippi or Alabama or the Midwest or Missouri because it wasn't getting up to 100. It was not getting past 90. So we had this very strange climate. I knew it was unique the first time I visited back in 2013 when I saw rows of cabbages growing underneath cocoa trees. I thought, wow. Cocoa tree is a truly tropical tree. Can't take the cold at all. It likes it warm and humid. It likes humidity all the time. And then you've got this northern climate. I would consider a very temperate vegetable. Cabbages? Cabbages. Growing in neat little rows because it didn't get too hot for the cabbages and it didn't get too cold for the cocoa. Permanent spring. About 54 inches of rain a year. The main seasonal changes were between dry season and rainy season. So when it got dry, it often got very dry. You might have a month without uh, appreciable rainfall. And when it rained, it really rained. And so generally, when you have this rainy season cycle, you know, you have a monsoon season in India. Uh, you've got your rain rain season, dry season, rainy season, dry season. That's your equivalent of summer and winter in a temperate climate. You might think, well, the, the slightly cooler time of the year would be the time to plant your garden. But you couldn't unless you had good irrigation because it was too dry. Everything would just dry up and the ground would be cracked. It might be a little cooler outside, but it was, man, it was dry. And then part of that dry season, as it started to get into early spring, actually got hotter than it would get later into the summer when the rain started coming in and cooling it down. So, all right, that, we're not talking about bonsai uh, this evening, so uh, we will answer that if we get to the end uh, and have time. So... What, what you ended up with was if you decided to garden without irrigation, which I, I, I garden with minimal irrigation as much as possible. I try not to waste uh, a lot of resources and I try to grow stuff that kind of grows with the, the climate as much as I can. And, and, it's, and it's, it's largely just because I'm lazy and because I don't like plumbing and because I've rented quite a bit while I was experimenting with different gardening methods and in different places. Uh, putting in permanent irrigation was not always in the cards. I also have a certain amount of paranoia about complicated systems and the potential for them failing. So I would always say, okay, what happens if the grid goes down and we can't pump water with the well? How would we take care of our gardens? How much water do we need and how would we water them? So we do a little bit of hand watering or you know, that sort of thing, or space things broadly, or plant when the rains came in. And a lot of people uh, on Grenada did not have the money or the resources or the availability of water to actually irrigate through that dry season. If you could irrigate through the dry season, you made pretty good money because there was a paucity of vegetables and fruits available during that season. It dropped off. And if you could get like lots and lots of nice cabbages or something, then it was good. But it usually entailed running a gas pump and pumping water out of a river. So if you had to have a river that you were near in order to do that. So you usually, 
in that kind of a climate where you've got the dry season and the rainy season, you put your gardens in at the beginning of the rainy season because the rain will water them in well. And this is something to remember when you're planting trees, whether it's a grocery row gardening system or a food forest system or anything else. If you plant with the weather, you have much more success because you're working with nature rather than countering nature. So your, your trees, if you planted your trees in the dry season, you had to put water on them. And a lot of the nurseries didn't even sell fruit trees until the rainy season. If you put them in with the rainy season, it would rain pretty regularly every day or two or three and they would never dry out. And by the end of the rainy season, the roots were usually established well enough that they could go right through the dry season. So that's kind of an interesting thing to think about. You're not necessarily planting with the climate so much uh, for the, thank you, sweetie, for the, uh, the warmth and the cool, you're planting for when water is available and how much work do you have to do. You could literally go put 25 potted trees out in your yard in the month of June when the rains started. And the way we knew the rains were going to start was that was when the ants put on their wings. When the ants put on their wings, it was time. It was go time. So what that means is when the ants started swarming out of the hills and going flying, when the new queens came up for the mating dance and the drones and the queens were flying around for the mating season, they knew that the rainy season was coming and that's when they would establish new colonies. So that was, that was fascinating. And I found that out from a local farmer. Wait until the ants put on their wings. So that when the ants put on their wings and they go flying, that was the time that the rainy season was going to start. And you were usually safe to put in your crops without irrigation and your fruit trees. So you could literally take 25 trees, stick them in the ground sometime in June, just dig holes, stick them out in your yard, and ignore them. And they would grow. They would, they would grow so fast. There was so much rain and the soil was nice and rich. It was a volcanic clay loam. So the stuff would just, whoop, boom, it grows. That was cool. Thank you very much, Leo, for the uh, super chat. I appreciate the tip. D. Waller says, plant the corn when the oak leaves are the size of a mouse ear. That's right. It's just one of these things that you learn. It's, a, it's accumulated wisdom that has been passed on from generation to generation. And so if you're going to put in a grocery row garden system in the tropics, it makes sense to track the cycles first. If you were doing it in a temperate climate, you track it too, but you might want to put them in in the fall so the roots get established through the winter. They go into dormancy. They come out of dormancy in the spring and they wake up with the spring rains. Or you might put in bare root trees in the spring so they wake up, plant in a new location, come out of dormancy, and they grow strong. But if you were to, say, transplant a bunch of nice green trees in the middle of a hot summer when it's 95 degrees out, you better have water on those things because any root disturbance, any of that transplanting disturbs the roots. That causes some damage. But also all that leaf material has to get enough water so it doesn't draw away from the roots and kill the plant. So... You really got to you got to plant with the climate, which makes a lot of sense. But one of the awesome things about the tropics was that you have an incredible amount of growth ability. So, whereas in a temperate climate, a plant might have five warm months of time to grow. You have 12 warm months. It's limited by lack of moisture, but if you overcome the lack of moisture, like Psalm 1 says, like a tree planted by streams of water bearing its fruit in its season, if you planted your trees along the river or if you had irrigation to get them started at the beginning, the potential growth rate and the amount of food you can pull out of a space is stunning, astounding. Things grow so fast. It was 
almost startling how if you didn't cut the grass, the grass would be over your head in a few months. You had to hack that grass down pretty regularly or else it would grow over your head. You could get so much biomass in such a short period of time. It was ridiculous. Absolutely crazy. So the potential for any garden is very high in the tropics, provided you are growing plants that fit the climate. So if you're, it, it, people often have this problem of wanting the thing that they don't have, right? So if a girl has blonde hair, maybe she wanted black hair growing up. If she has black hair, she wished she had blonde hair. If some, if a man is is short, he wishes he was tall. If a man is rich, he wishes he didn't have so many responsibilities. Everybody has something that they, you know, they kind of wish they, wish they had, uh, and wishes that 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 could be done. And so, I've I get a lot of emails from people say down in South Florida, which is a tropical climate, because I've written Florida gardening books. I get emails from people in South Florida saying, "Hey." How do I grow blueberries down here? I'm like, oh my goodness. Possibly you could get some southern high bush blueberry varieties that will manage that very low to non-existent chill hours. However, why would you want to grow blueberries? I love blueberries. Have you tried the black Suriname cherries? Have you tried Jamaica cherries? Have you tried Acerola cherries? Have you tried mulberries? Have you eaten Grumichama? Have you had Cherry of the Rio Grande? There's all these tropical small fruits. Pereschia. I mean, there's all these really cool little things that you could, you could eat that would fill in that gap of small fruit, but it's not a blueberry. I just wish I could grow blueberries. You could grow a thousand other tropical fruits, but it's not blueberry. If you live up north, man, I wish I could grow bananas. I wish I could grow coconuts in my backyard. I wish I could grow mangoes, but I can't grow mangoes up here. You know, but you're in the best apple country in the world. Think of all the varieties of apple you can grow, say, in Michigan. All those Michigan apple varieties. You could grow northern spy. Man, you could grow russeted apples. You could grow King David apples. You can grow all kinds of cool old varieties of apples. Stamen wine sap. That's a cool apple. But, kind of wish I could grow bananas. Kind of wish I could grow bananas, man. Oh. So, we tend to want what we can't have. So, down in the tropics, if you're growing plants that actually fit the tropics, holy moly, your production can be crazy. You can plant a banana pup in your grocery row garden at the beginning of the year and ha often have bananas coming on by the end of the year. Within a year, you usually get bananas. That's pretty fast. And not only that, after you get one banana tree, you get all those little pups that grow around it. The next year, you go, might get two stalks of bananas or three stalks of bananas, four stalks of bananas. You can divide all those little ones off and get more and more and more and more, and it grows so fast. You can almost watch the banana trees grow when you put them in the ground. When it's wet and rainy and they're in decent soil, you throw a little manure around them, they grow crazy. So your problem with grocery row gardening in the tropics is almost more a problem of keeping it from becoming completely overgrown because of the sheer amount of rapidity that a lot of these tropical plants grow in and how long and warm it is. You don't get a break. My grocery row gardens give me a break in Alabama. I have a little bit coming out of them. I can dig some roots through the winter. I could pull up some roots. I can get some cold hardy greens if I remember to plant some in there. But the crazy growth of summer is totally over. And you get a few months to just go around and clean everything up and you've got all these trees with bare branches and you can just co cut a little piece over here and cut a little piece over here. And, oh, I'm going to just change the shape of this, and I could fix this, and I could throw some mulch down. And you could take your sweet time. Just get around to it when you get around to it. Until March comes, and everything wakes up again, and it starts to run. So, down in the tropics, you don't really get a break. 
Our first grocery row garden system down there was based heavily around the tall trees in the system being fast growing herbaceous plants. So bananas are not true trees. They have a pseudo stem. They're not woody. They're actually bulbing. They're more akin to growing onions than they are to growing an oak, for example. Big bulb beneath the ground that puts up stalks, which then fruit, and then you chop that stalk down, and then the next one comes out of there, the next shoot comes out of the root, the next shoot comes out of the root, and they, they fruit, and then you after they fruit, you chop that stalk down, that fake tree, and the next tree does it. So your bulb is basically the life of the banana. That's The root is the eternal part of it, and it puts up different shoots again and again and again and again. So knowing that bananas work well as a straight vertical element, they were fast food. Bananas are a fast-growing food in the tropics. And so I put bananas at the 12-foot mark. Instead of putting deciduous-type fruit trees, I put bananas in there, and they grew super fast. I did the same thing with plantains, super fast. And another one that was really good for that fast vertical herbaceous growth were papayas. Instead of buying papaya trees or transplanting papaya trees, I found that I could just go, I could, I could get a papaya fruit, take the seeds out of it, scrape a little circle in the middle of one of those beds and just jam in five or ten seeds right out of the fruit, cover it over. In about three weeks, I would have little papaya shoots there. And I would let two or three of them grow, usually three of them, until they got to about my chest height. And at that point, they started usually to start putting out blooms. When they started to put out blooms, I could tell if they were male or female. If they were male, I would cut most of them down because they didn't make fruit. They just produced pollen. And I would leave one here and there. But I would select out, I would get rid of two of them and leave one. And then for the next three years or so, you get papayas off of that tree. And eventually it starts to decline. But it was so easy to just scrape a little bit out of the way, throw some seeds on the ground, and cover them. That way the roots went directly down. And they grew right in place. So they were very strong right from the beginning. And one of the things that gave me this idea was I noticed as the dry season progressed, a lot of the papaya trees would just be all over the, you know, the hillsides alongside the water ditches and here and there. There were papaya trees that had just escaped cultivation and they had fruit all over them. So we could just go harvest fruits from the woods anytime we wanted them or from empty land or areas that had gotten tilled under and then neglected because the birds would plant the seeds. So we would, during the dry season, there were usually quite a few papaya until later in the season. Often they would start giving up because it would just get too dry for too long. And they would, you, we could just go and harvest all the fruit you wanted, but also the fruit were getting chewed into and the seeds were getting spread around by various animals and fruit bats and stuff like that. When the rainy season started, there were papaya seeds in animal droppings all over the place. So you, you could till up a garden bed to, say, grow corn, and you would find two or three papaya seedlings coming up with your corn. Just They were just everywhere. But they would just sit there and sleep on the ground. Those little seeds would just sleep in the thatch of the dead grass or whatever until the rain started and they would they would start germinating and here's one here's one here's one here's one man i it was so surprising to just see there's a fruiting plant that's just growing itself it's just growing where did that come from it's just out there the tropics have a lot of vitality you got food just showing up all on its own that's really easy but we took advantage of it by saying, okay, let's just take bits of these papayas, stuff them into here and there through the grocery row gardens where we want them to go. And the nice thing about papayas is that they grow straight up, super vertical, and they make this little tuft of leaves at the top. And that tuft of leaves at the top, 
and that nice tall trunk barely shaded anything around them so you could grow right up to the trunks of those papaya trees and just have them emerging so we talked a little bit already about the verticality of this system how it's a vertical gardening system where you want as much solar capture as possible you will see a palm layer in the tropics in tropical food forest systems like jeff lawton designed jeff lawton talks about the palm layer the palm layer is a palm layer there's a palm layer where these trees come out over the top of the canopy with this really long trunk and this puff at the top of it of leaves and fruit that's pretty cool right barely shades anything another thing about that tropical climate is that the solar energy is much higher so even if you have some shade, you can grow beneath it. So when something says, you know, when you read a seed packet and it says, full sun. No, it does not need full sun in the tropics because the solar energy is high. If you are of my complexion and you go to the beach at one in the afternoon in the Caribbean on a clear day, a half an hour you are sunburned the further north you go you can often be outside for an hour or more or two hours or three hours you don't even think about it but tourists were regularly getting absolutely torched you know this girl will go down there and try on her bikini that she's never worn before it's her vacation bikini and and she'll take it and go lay on the beach out there and her husband will have his little pair of shorts on, and that's his vacation bathing suit because up in the Midwest, you know, we don't get to lay out in the sun like this. You know, it's cold in those lakes and stuff. And they would, both of them would be walking like this for the rest of their vacation and peeling skin. There's a huge amount of energy coming out of the sun. And so having that little bit of shade uh, over the top, it doesn't even affect it. You could easily vegetable garden beneath the shade of some palm trees and the vegetables do just fine even the reflected light is enough and uh it's it's uh the first bit of it with that canopy i generally tend to do papayas and bananas particularly because we were looking for very fast food production and both of those will produce food within a year so the other thing that you could do is with your tropical trees put your tropical trees down the center of those grocery row gardens but remember it's not going to work like temperate trees where you are going to prune them during the winter when they're dormant and then prune them when they're very actively growing in order to reduce vigor probably to reduce the vigor of tropical trees the best thing you could do would be to prune it in the middle of the rainy season when it's very actively growing to reduce some of the vigor but know that you're always going to be fighting with those trees to keep them under control so if you could select trees um, like spondius purpurea um, I, there's a lot of different names for that one it's a tree that stays moderately small and to when you plant mango trees if you're gonna put a mango in your grocery row garden prune the living daylights out of it out of the beginning and know that that thing is still going to want to become a ball but if you are very active in your pruning and you repeatedly do it you can make a mango fruit at even five foot in height it's very possible i had a mango growing in a big pot in my greenhouse uh that went into bloom and fruit and it was a seedling that i grew and after five or six years it went into bloom and it fruited but the, the pot was about a 40 gallon pot you can keep it, but you're going to have to stay on top of it. Your tropical climate grocery rows are going to very rapidly want to turn into a huge tropical rainforest mess that will exclude you completely. And you've got to watch out for your creeping vines because there are various tropical vines that will come up and through and cover much like kudzu and just choke out the entire system really quickly. One of the things that happened 
usually at the beginning of the rainy season, would be that farmers would go out and they would clear all the brush and everything around their trees, try to cut all the vines off, slash all the grass down, and they would just lay the grass in piles here and there in between their trees to rot down into the ground. And so all the vines get slashed off the trees, all the grass gets slashed down, and then the rains would start. And everything would grow back really, really quickly. The vines would start growing and everything. And then a couple of times during the rainy season, the farmers, if they were active, would go back and slash everything down to the ground again and spread it out around the trees and just let it rot into the ground. So there was always compost happening. The system was always trying to eat your trees. And it was a never-ending fight. Often, if you visited a homestead that had been put up for sale and had not been tended for more than six months you would just see all of these big fluffy mounds of vines and you would have no idea what kind of trees were under them Be you could actually my children found out that you could walk on top of the vines growing across portions of the jungle they would actually go on hands and feet and crawl across these thick vine layers and they might have been eight feet over the ground with tree canopy and darkness beneath there but you could grab and walk across how thick those vines were that was crazy so you have to make sure that that system is is keeping under control so one of the things that i did which uh i don't generally do in the temperate climate but i i would actually just go out with hunks of cardboard and throw them down on the ground during the rainy season over the pathways that I was walking because they would get watered and beat into the ground and they would suppress the weeds enough to maintain the pathway. One of your problems in the tropics is if you want to mulch your grocery row garden system, because everything is warm and moist regularly, it would rot down so fast. People would say, why don't you throw down wood chips? Why don't you use wood chips in your garden? Well, first of all, nobody had the infrastructure to cut up wood chips. So far as I know, there was only one wood chipper on the island. It was not on our side. The city did not come by and chip stuff. You couldn't, you know, write up, you know, sign up a chip drop. But the other thing that would happen is if you put wood on the ground, it would rot. And it would rot very fast. It would be covered in mushrooms and full of ants and termites in a very short period of time, and it would crumble and melt into the ground. Like tree trunks would be half rotted in a year or so because of how moist and warm it was. It was a perfect incubator for bacterial and fungal growth. So if you're mulching in your grocery row garden system, and you do have mulch, say you got sugarcane bagasse, or you were able to get wood chips. Depending on your climate, you might be in Hawaii, and you might have access to a lot of that first world, you know, wood chips and that sort of thing. It doesn't last particularly long. It goes really fast. We made compost so fast down there because between the rain, the humidity, and the perfect temperatures for bacterial and fungal growth, you could make compost really, really quickly. But your mulch is just gone. So I found that something that was useful to do was to reserve spots that could be used for growing mulch and to use all of the tropical trimmings and prunings as mulch. So this idea with the cannas that I have, I have these canna, canna musifolia uh, that my daughter occasionally sells in her seed store. These canna musifolias are very fast growing tropical canna that during the hot and rainy Alabama summer grows just like nuts. There are all kinds of gingers and cannas and bananas and other things that grow like that down in the tropics and can be repeatedly chopped and dropped and chopped and dropped, but you have to do it all the time. You pretty much have to go around with your machete every day and do something because otherwise the system will get out of hand. Now the benefit of having a system that is so alive and active is that you get fruit and vegetables out of it super fast. So let's say you've got your canopy trees, right? Your 
gonna put in some bananas and some papaya and some mangoes and some ice cream bean because ice cream bean is a nitrogen fixer and it's a nice little fruit maybe you put in a star apple and you're gonna prune the living daylights out of it maybe you put in a fig you do some of these trees down the rows when you do this think where am I going to get biomass to throw around the base of them so you might grow some cannas you might leave some banks of tall tropical grasses that you could cut and throw down there you might have an area of bamboo that you could gather leaves from we gathered a lot of bamboo leaves it was this thick thatch of bamboo leaves about this deep constantly rotting down to the ground and we would go and, and load a tarp up with it drag it back to the gardens just a little bit uphill spread it in between to try and suppress particularly that vine growth that was happening and when I had the vine showing up on the ground I would do the same thing I would just rip up cardboard from the big dumpster of cardboard and throw cardboard over the ground and that cardboard would disappear fast too but often it would kill the vines that were underneath it and sometimes I threw down cardboard and I would get fancy and throw some leaves on top of it and sometimes I was just throwing down cardboard because I didn't want the vines to get ahead of me so when you've got your rows there, remember that you're also going to be able to use all of the biomass that you are pruning out of those trees because those trees are going to be constantly growing. So you get a harvest of bananas and you get this great big banana stalk. It might be 12 foot of super thick, wet banana trunk. Slice that sucker down at the bottom after you harvest. Chop that thing up into pieces and lay those pieces over the ground as mulch that was a really nice mulch and it's a big part of Ernst Goetsch's syntropic agriculture or syntropic farming that syntropic system is very well designed for the tropics and that's the angle you want to go towards with your grocery row gardens with using this biomass and most of his gardening is done with chainsaws chainsawing down trees and deliberately growing super tall trees that then get chainsawed down and then cut repeatedly over and over and over again you've got the uh, Bacano tree which is oh let me think I'm trying to remember it's the same as a moth it's got the same Latin name as a moth Cecropia Cecropia peltata. They grow super, super fast, and you can smoke the leaves like tobacco if you want to. It tastes very similar to tobacco. You could use it as a uh, as a filler to fill out if you were, you know, cutting your tobacco leaf. But it doesn't have any nicotine in it, so it's kind of useless. But you could chop that stuff up and drop it, and just really roughly mulch. So in your grocery or gardens, you might grow a section of corn and then chop it all up in a section of sugarcane you might chop a bunch of sugarcane pieces when you shred all those leaves off and you've got the parts that are pressed out or waste you throw that back in there but you constantly got to throw stuff on the ground palm fronds uh, thinning out stuff that's that's showing up when a, when your banana clumps get too thick you cut about half of it out chop all those pieces up and just throw them down and man it is incredible both how fast stuff grows and how much the ground eats that organic matter. It just eats it constantly. The, the tropics are like a massive digester. So it may make sense to dedicate the occasional row of your grocery row gardening system mostly to biomass producing plants. So huge, tall grasses, Sudan grass, uh, Tithonia diversifolia. I think somebody mentioned Tithonia diversifolia a minute ago. Tithonia diversifolia, which grows very fast. It is a perennial sunflower. Chop those suckers down. You could grow all kinds of nitrogen-fixing trees that you could chop down. You could use Royal Poinciana tree as a chop and drop. Why not? You can use um, the Cecropia trees yeah, that's right. Mexican sunflower for chop and drop. Uh, Bra Rebel Bear says, I just started using elephant ears for mulch. They grow like crazy. Yeah, absolutely. 
Absolutely. And there's some of these ornamental gingers that get about 10 feet tall. They have these huge spear-like leaves. Chop those up. Use bird of paradise. Napier grass. There's another good uh, good suggestion. So you got all these all these things. And you're going to just throw them down your rows and down your pathways so you don't have... It, it's, always a, it's always a fight to keep stuff going. Lemongrass works awesome. Yep, that's another good one. Um, uh, sweet root grass is another one. Vetiver. Yes, you can chop and drop roselle, but it does not give you a lot of biomass, really. Cabbage palm fronds in South Florida. Yep. There's a lot of stuff that works really well as a chop and drop. Uh, the sun hemp works well. It's a, uh, it's just a fight to stay ahead of it. But I, I love, I love the feeling of almost getting overrun by your own garden because it's so crazy. It's so insanely fast. Your grocery row gardens in the tropics are going to be about twice to three to four times as productive as they will be in a temperate system. And that's just the reality we have to deal with if we're not living in the tropics. It's so easy to grow food in the tropics that you can just about not garden and still have food. Really, it's just a matter of sticking fruit trees in the ground when the rains start and then occasionally macheteing the vines off of them like nothing I was not in Hawaii I was in Grenada and I moved back to Alabama because the, everything got crazy during the pandemic so yes that is a cane machete that's what that is that is a cane machete that's why it looks it's got that square edge to it so with your tropical climate grocery row gardens, uh, to get fast production, I found one of the best combinations for food production during the pandemic when we were growing our, our first set of true grocery row gardens was to put bananas and plantains and papayas as the center, knowing that bananas and plantains function both as a fruit and as a starchy vegetable, much like a root. So if you harvested those plantains when they were younger and green, or the bananas when they were green, they were very much like a potato, and you could you could cook them that way. Put them in stews and get filled up. It was starchy and not sweet. So that's very valuable when you're hungry. And we wanted to have lots and lots of food coming out of our, our gardens, and we did we did very well. So that was the peak of it, and then some fruit trees in between. And then our main shrubs that we used were, um, we had some roselle, but that was just a, sort of an incidental thing because it makes a nice tea and you can eat the leaves, but it isn't something that really fills you up. And I had a lot of cassava. I grew cassava as an interspacing, so you've got your you know, your banana trees at 12 feet, and in between, I would put a cassava. Or I would put a chaya, which is Mexican tree spinach, so we had lots and lots of cooked greens. Or I would put a small fruit, like uh, Suriname cherry, or I also had uh, Paresquia, which I liked. Those are pretty cool. They're a climbing cactus, but you have to have something to control them because they want to roll all over the place. And uh, I put in, let's see, what was the other one? I had another good small fruit that we were growing inside of those rows. I don't remember what it was uh, at the moment. But, oh, Jibutacaba. Jibutacaba was pretty controllable and could be kept moderately small. So we had these, you know, tall, short, tall, short, tall, short. But the amount of roots that we got, uh, along with the bananas and the plantains, we had plenty of our starches. But not only that, as the ground cover layer in between all of that, we had great luck growing different varieties of sweet potatoes. The sweet potatoes were a fantastic mulch in the system. And anytime we tore up our sweet potatoes or had an open patch, we would stick in a few vegetables. Uh, pak choy did really well with the warm weather. So we had a lot of pak choy and we also grew quite a few bush beans in the system and i love bush beans because they both fix nitrogen and give you a yield of a vegetable that's enjoyable so that was the the gap filling so we yank out one thing and we throw some of them in i also grew a few good patches of 
tobacco and I would put in tomatoes and eggplants and hot peppers and medicinal herbs and other plants scattered through the system with a lot of tanya and taro which are two different types of edible elephant ear and that really man it was producing like crazy tons and tons yeah the sweet potatoes also function as a good greens that's right uh Sassman 3 says one mango tree can feed an entire village they grow so big and broad that's true but we didn't want it to get big and broad because we only had a half an acre so I planted multiple mango trees and then pruned the living daylights out of them to make them more hedge style than giant style that way uh, we didn't have the entire yard end up shaded and overrun is Johnson grass invasive in the tropics I, I have heard so but I don't know for sure we did we didn't deal with it so the amount of food that you could pull out of a tropical system is excellent and you may you know we started with two foot spacing in those rows and then we switched to three foot spacing and we were much more satisfied with three foot spacing because it was really hard to keep two foot wide pads clear everything wants to grow together and you can see a video i did a video called vertical gardening the permaculture way which is in my grocery row gardens down there in the tropics and you could see what it looked like when it was fully out and it was the most beautiful garden that i had ever made we planted lots of zinnias in between just because they were beautiful and we had all these beautiful elephant ears and bananas are gorgeous anyways I wanted to experiment with putting the occasional palm tree into the rows because I think that would work quite well uh, but there is a bit of a risk when you plant coconut palms because they tend to lean in different directions and you may just have to work around that what variety of fig if humid and some rains uh, brown turkey and Celeste are both recommended for the south and in that in that kind of a climate and if you can get any figs from the University of uh, Louisiana they have some very good ones as for mango varieties plant whatever mango variety you want in the tropics uh, I would go and taste test as many mangoes as you can and then plant your favorites I, I love them all you could chop and drop zinnias yes <laughs> so when you're building a, a a tropical climate grocery row garden I think just remember that you're going to have to be chainsawing and cutting remember that you don't need to have full Sun so if you have stuff that grows quickly and it puts bits of canopy here and there like your bananas and your papayas and your palm trees that's fine if you put in little fruit trees even as they get bigger you're still usually able to grow most vegetables in the dappled shade you don't need full Sun and you're going to have to try and keep your pathways under control either by slashing everything down with a machete and dropping it on the ground or chopping it regularly or hoeing it regularly. I used a wheel hoe to keep my paths clear to begin with. And then bit by bit, I mulched through the system as it matured. And then I used lots and lots of chopped material to just continuously do it. Every time you pull out some more beans or you prune the trees or stuff chop it into pieces and just lay it on the ground and let it become the pathways and if you want to make sure that you get lots of food out of it definitely bananas plantains yams sweet potatoes taro edos tanya those will keep you fed and the sweet potatoes and they will keep you full that's what you want to concentrate on you can get tons and tons of sweet beautiful wonderful fruits in the tropics but that's not necessarily what's going to fill you up or what you want to eat all day long unless you're a fruititarian you want the stuff that's going to be starchy and will fill you up and keep your stomach full and that's really you know something you should concentrate on and also if you can concentrate on getting those good fats by growing coconuts definitely grow coconuts anywhere you can grow coconuts grow coconuts because that is an all-around superfood and it has the use as oils it has good fats in it it has all the electrolytes from the water you can make milk out of it which is fantastic you can uh, make all kinds of things out of the palm fronds you can use the lumber of a palm tree if you decide to cut it down one day and you can also eat the central bud like a cabbage there's so many different things you could do with it 
plus all the woodwork you can do with the bits of hard shell. Pretty cool. And the husks. The husks are fantastic for making your own potting soil mixes and rotting down into a very good water-filled compost. Uh, so, yeah, coconut and avocado. Avocado is another good one for fats. So do it if you can. And uh, I will answer some questions now. Um, if anybody has questions, we have it wide open this evening. Peach palms are a good, a good idea. I've never grown them, but I've heard they're very good as a staple. Motley says, I've heard date palms don't work good in humid climates because the dates mold before you can eat them. Yeah, and they, and they often have problems with pollination, too. Uh, there was a date palm right on the beach down in Grenada that was a beautiful palm, but it was not fruiting, unfortunately. I had a couple of date palms in my North Florida food forest, but I think they died after I moved. <clears throat> Let's see here. Dan says, trying sweet potatoes here in Northeast Massachusetts. So far, so good. Oranges grow well in the tr islands. I've heard, yes, that is true. The, um, the funny thing about growing citrus in the tropics is that the rinds were usually green, even though the inside would be orange. How would you describe the taste of a loquat? It depends on the loquat. Most of the seedling loquats have a tart, sharp, sub-acid flavor with some sweetness underneath. And they, they'll make your cheeks pucker a little bit. Like, woo! Man, I don't feel like a uh, But some of them are very sweet. And I have had... I've had some very nice sweet ones. Um, that are improved varieties. They tend to have a small pit and a much larger fruit. And they're much more like candy dessert. But I think that the taste of the tart ones is great when you make chutneys out of it or preserve it. I do not know if lamb's quarter is a lullopathic. Yes, you can get fall mushrooms there in Michigan. We, we had some decent chanterelles in North Florida. Pastor Don says, is dragon fruit worth growing? I like it. There are some varieties that have better flavor than others. Uh, the I had a pretty good article. My daughter wrote an article on growing dragon fruit. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, we visited a Chinese research facility in the Caribbean where they were growing. Let me see. Dragon fruit. <clears throat> And it was, it was pretty cool. Check this out. You'll, you'll like this uh, system, I think. They had these individual supports for them where they would climb up through it. It was like a wheel of iron on top of a post. And the dragon fruit would come down through it and fruited. They fruited like crazy. And they were very, um, they're very refreshing on a hot day. If you are in a colder climate, however, like up into zone 8... Peruvian apple cactus makes a fruit that is very, very similar to dragon fruit, and it's excellent. Very good. But it is much more cold hardy. Have a great evening, Robert. Robert says, My food forest is coming along by a lot of my seeds. Along by a lot of my seeds went into my neighbor's yard, so I guess her food forest is going along as well. Yes, share. That's right. That's a good way to put it. Good Times Homestead says, Kumquats are little tart oranges. Loquats are like mild apricots. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Pastor John says, We make loquat wine. That sounds good. Mary says, The date palms died because they were sad that I left. That's quite possible. Is it true banana is technically a berry? You know, these... <laughs> these descriptions sometimes... You know, watermelon is a berry, but such and such is actually a fruit, and such and such is really truly a pseudo... Whatever. You know, these, these things are for nerds. It's a fruit. 
So, and a berry is a little thing. <laughs> I read all this technical literature and I'm like, man, they spend a lot of time on some of this, you know, uh, technical. It's sort of like, actually, actually, and well, that's the berry. Okay. It's cool, it's fine. Dirty Dog Farm says, How can I rid my garden beds of millipedes? I'm talking hundreds of them. Are they doing harm? I honestly can't tell. Bad time of year in Ocala. LOL. We had the millipedes in our beds in in Ocala area, and I didn't find that they were a problem. As a matter of fact, millipede droppings are very good for the garden, which is kind of funny. There are people that... There are people that... Uh, there was a place called Millipoo that was doing uh, millipede castings. I don't know if they're still doing it. It was pretty funny. Um, but they were selling millipede castings. So instead of having a worm bin, they had a millipede bin. So I found that the millipedes generally ate stuff that was already damaged or was rotting or had fallen off or was overripe. Now, I don't know if your millipedes are eating everything, but I never worried about them. I, I like them, generally. But usually if you have an infestation where you've got hundreds of something, it's a seasonal thing and it's going to change. Some predator is going to come in there and take over and then in a year or two you won't see any for a period of time or very few. I've seen this sort of thing happen before. You get the plague of caterpillars year where there's just caterpillars everywhere. And if you don't spray anything and you just, just live through it, often the next year uh, the predators have come in and they've just balanced the ecosystem out it's usually just a flood of something but nature has a lot of checks and balances i remember one time uh the inspector the nursery inspector came over and she was looking at some grapes that i had which were not in the nursery they were just out uh along the edge of my gardens i had some grapes on the rows and she says those are aphids all over there you should spray those and i said no no no, i'm not spraying them i said uh i said they'll get taken care of and she's like, by what? And I said, well, the, the ladybug life cycle is coming in pretty soon here. They'll, they'll take care of them. I'm not worried about not worried about it. And I said, over here, look at this. That's a ladybug larva. There's a ladybug larva. There's a ladybug larva. See, if, you, if I went in and sprayed, I would have just killed the ladybugs too. I'd rather just not do anything and then just see what happens. Now, sometimes there is a time, like if you're really afraid that you know, this is the only food you've got, and you've got a plague of locusts, you better go out and get rid of it, and fight it, and, you know, go spray your DDT or whatever, but generally I just ignore that stuff, and uh, know that nature balances it out over time. So. <clears throat> um, let's see, where are we here? Let's see. Any ideas why my mammoth elephant ears are staying tiny and low to the ground in northwest Florida? Good question. There's, there's a possibility here that you don't have mammoth elephant ears. Sometimes nurseries mix up and sometimes things get mislabeled and resold as things that they are not. So you could have something that is not a mammoth elephant ear. You could have a variety of Dachin or some other Xanthosoma or Colocasia that wasn't as advertised. Alternately, there could be, it could be that there is not enough water or fertility in that area. If it is a, if there is construction debris underneath the ground, if it's not particularly rich, if it's in a very dry area, it's alongside of a driveway, if the ground is compacted, if the nutrients are low, if the pH is off, it could keep them dwarfed and small and sad. There are elephant ears that are taller than me by about three or four feet at a friend's place uh, further north of me because he has his big chicken house and they sell eggs at, uh, you know, in front of a store. They have their farm eggs for sale. And behind his chicken house, there's this area where they just threw all the manure and stuff. And they had some elephant ears that had been back there. And the elephant ears have gotten absolutely insane because I think there's both this uh, water drain that's running back there, plus there's all of this chicken manure coming through. They're very, very hungry for nitrogen, and they grow 
like crazy if they have more nitrogen and water. Let me see here. Laura says, what could be planted now for South Georgia? Good question. You could put in another round of green beans right now. You could put in another round of cucumbers. Uh, you could put some tomato transplants or hot pepper transplants out right now, knowing that you're going to get to a point uh, in about three months where you probably get your first freeze. So we're, we're about at the point, too, where you could just about start putting out transplants. You could put out uh, collards. You could direct seed cabbages and daikons right now, provided it doesn't, you know, we don't have a really freaky, very hot time. Um, we're coming into the fall season, and you could get a lot of stuff going through the fall that's a little cooler season. It's going to get cooler over the next few months pretty rapidly here. Could you push the zone to grow avocados in North Texas, zone 8A outside? Yes. You need avocados that have Mexican genes. So uh, Leela and Fantastic, and there's a few others. They can take temperatures down into the teens. So yes, you have to get the right varieties of avocado. There are cold hardy avocados that can take temperatures as low as the lower teens. Zone 8A, you could probably get away with it if you were in a somewhat sheltered location. But if it gets down to like 5 degrees overnight, it'll probably kill it. I would plant one along the south-facing wall of your house and just keep it pruned back. Uh, I'm trying to get through here. Yeah, let's see. Uh, Rhea says, I'm an 8B. Usually everything dies in the heat July to mid-September. Is there a good home cover crop for that time? Oh, yeah. Uh, Black-eyed peas or any of your field field pea type, uh, you know, crowder peas. Those are real good. Uh, sorghum sedan grass is really good. And um, the sun hemp worked really, really well for me this year. Okay, betting it's the nitrogen since I placed it by the valley of my metal roof. Yeah, uh, go throw a chicken manure on it or um, pee in a jar and then go dump it out by it a couple of times. You know, mix it in. <laughs> Pour it around the edge a little bit. Not right on it. But that's not a lot of nitrogen in it. Or go throw some turf fertilizer out there. It'll go crazy. <laughs> Yep, yeah, peanuts. You could use peanuts in the heat as well. Petra says, I still don't know when to pick avocados. You gotta pick them when they're not ripe. <laughs> hey, Joe. So, I am going to call it this evening because I have some uh, friends coming over in a little bit here. Somebody said I have to sing a song, so I'll sing a song. I don't... I don't know. I've been doing this, you know, good stream university thing here, and I'm trying to get as much information out and kind of have some outline to it. And it's like, it's not very silly, you know? This is not silly stuff. I just, I, I just, I'm playing a song. I don't know. Let's see here. David, I recently got your book on creating a nursery And I wonder, particularly on the plant pricing What kind of parameters do you consider? Material seeds time employed, height of the plant How you price those suckers First you've got your base materials Say 20 cents a potting soil plus a pot. Then you figure you've got your time involved in your irrigation. 
So you better make sure that you at least make a few bucks. If I'm buying wholesale and potting it up, I like to get an additional 100% on my time. So if I paid five bucks for something, I want at least get 10. But if I can get 20 times the price, I won't complain. Yes, Betty says, remember to pray for my brother Brian over at Flannel Farms. He has a, uh, a problem with a valve in his heart. He's three years younger than me. And um, pray that he comes through this okay. He's got a family to take care of. He's a firefighter and a homesteader at Flannel Farms. So he needs, uh, he does need our prayer. Thank you for reminding So let's see, what song could I sing tonight? I, I think, uh, I think it's been too long since I've done uh, a bossa nova. Let's get demonetized, huh? That's a nice one. That's one of my favorite bossa novas. Beautiful classic bossa nova from Brazil. Here's another one of my favorites. Try. 
Oh, police are paranoid. So am I. So's the future. So are you. Be a creature. What do you say? What do you do when it all comes down? Cause I don't want to come back down from this cloud. It's taken me all this, all this time to find out what I need. I don't want to come back down from this cloud. It's taken me all this, all this, all this, all this time. Shoot up, shoot up, shoot up. Love and hate, get it wrong She got me right back down the side Sleep the day, let it fade Who was there to take your place? No one knows, never will Mostly me, mostly you What do you say, what do you do When it all comes down? I don't want to come back down from this cloud It's taken me all this, all this, all this, all this time I don't want to come back down from this cloud This cloud That was Stan Getz right there with Astrid Gilberto. This cloud. Thank you all this evening. Um, thank you very much for the super chat, Karen. I'm sorry I missed that. <laughs> so we are going to be uh, continuing with Tropical Climate Grocery Road Gardening tomorrow. I will see you then. Just another day in paradise. <laughs> You know what? Um, I figured out. I figured out that LL Cool J. Mama's gonna knock you out. Makes a very good bossa nova. Mama says, Mama said, Mama said, knock you out. I mean, it's really good. Mama said, knock you out. Don't call it a comeback. I've been here four years, rocking my teeth. You know, so it's, it's really good. It's got this really good flow. Don't call it a comeback. Well, whatever. Anyhow, anyhow, you guys have a great evening. I hope that had a little bit of inspiration for you. I know that most of us are not in the tropics, so our viewership, etc., is not going to be as high on this one. But for those of you with tropical climate gardens right now. Who have written me and said thank you why did you move back to a temperate climate you were the only youtuber that was actually useful i'm sorry about that i did move back to a temperate climate my heart is in the tropics and so for those of you in the philippines and in indonesia and southeast asia and the caribbean equatorial africa and portions of south america and central america um i hope this was useful you probably knew all this already but thank you for watching any of you are moving to tropical climate my recommendation is go bananas, like T-Farm says. <laughs> Have a great evening. God bless you all. Until next time, may your thumbs always be green. And don't forget to check out Grocery Road Gardening if you want to figure out how I built the systems and how it works. Catch you soon.